Creoles are not a distinct kind of language, true or false? That is the question that I want to address in a brief series of presentations like this, where what I want to get at is, do linguists have any reason to be interested in these languages? Because I think they do. An increasingly influential group of Creolists think, although they don't put it this way, that linguists shouldn't be interested in any genuine way in Creole languages as a group of languages. For them, Creoles are just what happens when languages mix together, and that will be my lesson one. And we have to understand why this is an important question. Because if Creoles are just what happens when languages mix together, then there's no difference between Creoles and all languages because all languages are language mixtures to some extent. So we're dealing with what you could call a battle between the Creole exceptionalists and the uniformitarians. I am a proud Creole exceptionalist. The uniformitarians are a different group. So what's a uniformitarian? They don't call themselves that, but I don't want to have to keep saying their names over and over again. And they share a particular, actually eccentric, but in interesting ways to many attractive perspective. I have to use names. I'm talking about Sali Coco Mufwene, Michelle de Graff, Enoch Abo, and Umberto Ansaldo. These are people who think that Creole languages form the same way that Czech, Navajo, and Estonian did. And they think that calling any group of languages contact languages, much less Creoles, is a taxonomic mistake and also sinister for other reasons you can probably predict, but that I will barely touch on in this particular lesson. So, to the Creole exceptionalist, Creoles are of course mixtures, but they're much more streamlined than their parents. So you can see in this schema here that you have black and gray, and they produce a language that is part black and part gray, but it's smaller. And that's because if a language starts as a pigeon, if it starts with a break in transmission with starkly reduced resources and is not even a true language at all, and then it flowers into a real language, then especially at first it doesn't have the junk that needlessly accretes in older languages such as grammatical gender and lexical tone and all sorts of things that we're so used to seeing in languages that are there but aren't necessary to language. Now, it must be clear that by less complex, I don't mean lesser. I don't think that Creoles have too little of anything. Older languages have too much. That was really the main motivation of my book, The Language Hoax, where I tried to explain that so much of what we think of as what language typically is and that's somehow necessary to it is really just, to use an unscientific term, junk. None of it has anything to do with cognitive sophistication. And I will do one of these lessons about what complexity means, because that's something that there's been a great deal of confusion about. This is just a taste. Anyway, the uniformitarian schema is that a Creole language just combines features from its source languages. Feature selection is what Sally Coco Mufwene calls it, for example. So black square, gray square, and the result is a square with some black and some gray in it. That's the same size. Now, Mufwene, in my experience, has a penchant for saying that he's been misinterpreted and often deliberately when you try to disagree with him even politely. So I want to make clear the sorts of things he's written that motivate my statements here. So for example, the extent of morphological complexity in terms of range of distinctions retained by a contact language largely reflects the morphological structures of the target language and the particular languages that it came in contact with. He said that. What he means is that in contact languages there is no loss of complexity. It's been an illusion that we think so. Or, and here's something, because I think a lot of people think Sali Coco Mufwene is just saying that we have to take all of the languages in a genesis context into account. But frankly, nobody needs to say that. He's saying something more interesting in its way than that. He has said 
Second language acquisition research is largely irrelevant to Creole Genesis theory. He lays it out in black and white. That is what he's saying. Or let's take another uniformitarian, the more recently arrived Enoch Abo. Very nicely puts it. The claim that Creoles are simplified versions of their sources is a fallacy, just as it would be to claim in biology that hybrids are genetically simplified children of their parents. So, you'll see work by, for example, Abo. I chose this at random, but he'll have a piece called Creole Distinctiveness a Dead End, and there it is in print in a prestigious place, and it looks like that's somehow been decided. And now Abo has a whole book from a prestigious house, but, you know, let's face it, just because somebody has compiled a document with lots of pages, just because somebody has written something that is relatively long, doesn't mean that they've proven it simply by the fact that if you drop it on your foot, it hurts. <laughs> And so, for example, this is an entire book, but the idea that Creoles are just mixtures of languages is a radical proposition. That is spitting in the eye of 50 years of pidgin and Creole studies. Now, radical can be fun, but the question is, does this proposition hold up? And the truth is, Creole studies has subjected this idea to almost curiously little serious engagement. That's going to change now. So, how about a test? And it might surprise many of you to know, outside of Creole studies, that this test has not been applied. Let's test the idea that Creoles are just what happens when languages mix together. Palencaro is a Spanish-based Creole. It's spoken in Colombia, and it was created by speakers of really just two languages. You've got Spanish, you've got Kikongo. So, the question is, it's a very simple test. Is Palencaro just a hybrid of Spanish and Kikongo? Here we go. Here's Kikongo. Look how prefixed it is. It's also suffixed. This is a highly inflected language. That's what Bantu is like. Now, so is Spanish. We often think that European languages are going to be semi-analytic like English and French, at least the colonial ones. We tend to forget how highly inflected Iberian languages are. So, Spanish really has about as many bells and whistles as Kikongo. We're talking about the same sentence here. Notice, these great white stones are those which we have seen. I wanted to choose a nice, <laughs> spontaneous, <laughs> colloquial sentence, and there it is. Now, if languages that we call Creoles are just language mixtures, and we've all been crazy in thinking them as anything different, then we should be assuming that the Palencaro slide I'm about to show is a heavily inflected slide. That Palencaro is a heavily inflected language because mom and dad were. Look at Palencaro. Bam! Notice that this is a very different language from Kikongo and Spanish. And yes, I know that there are linguists these days who are questioning whether we can really be confident about the difference between an affix and a clitic and a free word. But notice that here, that whole debate, which in itself is very interesting, really only applies to one or two of these morphemes. This is a language that has simply lost a great many of the distinctions that both Spanish and Kikongo make, and it doesn't replace them with anything else. It's just gone. Now remember, Mufwene has written, the extent of morphological complexity retained by a contact language largely reflects the morphological structures of the target language and the particular languages that it came in contact with. We have just seen a stinging rebuke of that idea. So, look at all the stuff that Palencaro is missing, that both of its parents have. So it's not a matter of it having not taken something from Spanish, but then taken something from Kikongo. Noun phrase concord, gone. Obligatory marking of number, which is true of both Spanish and Kikongo, gone. Definite determiner, nothing. Now, Kikongo doesn't have that strictly, but it has the Bantu augment marker, which behaves a lot like a definite determiner. Nobody would be surprised if a language created from one that had a definite article and one that had an augment marker had some sort of definite article. Didn't happen in Palencaro. 
perfect from past, gone. Nothing like that in the entrenched fashion that you have in both Spanish and Kikongo. Differential object marking. And so, I kissed Charles beso a Carlos, that thing that's frustrating from English. That's differential object marking. And, you know, Kikongo has the equivalent too, but no, nothing like that in Palancaro. Or, why is in Palancaro, if what Creoles are is just mixtures of languages like Cupopia, this is a language spoken in Brazil, Portuguese, and Kikongo came together. And the result is basically Kikongo words situated sweetly within Portuguese's grammar in all of its elaboration. Well, isn't that what this uniformitarian idea would predict? But no, Palancaro is nothing like Cupopia, and Cupopia is nothing like Creoles. Now, obviously we have to consider that maybe Palancaro is a fluke. Because you can't abandon your theory just because there's some hair out of place. That wouldn't be good science. But the problem is that uniformitarianism is incompatible with most Creoles. You could basically, it's like blindfolding yourself and throwing a dart at a board. And almost anywhere the dart went in Creole world, this idea that languages are just mixtures, that Creole languages are just mixtures, just, it fails, frankly. Guinea-Bissau Creole Portuguese. West Atlantic languages, if any of you are familiar with them, well, enough said, and Portuguese. And yet, Guinea-Bissau Creole Portuguese is a highly analytic language. Yes, it's got an you know, affix or two, but it's a highly analytic language. Newbie Creole Arabic, never read about that in the uniformitarian literature. It is Arabic, again, enough said. And then some Nilo-Saharan languages, and wow. These languages are some of the most morphologically elaborate I've ever known. It's the kind of language family where you wonder how actual people could speak the language while also walking at the same time. And yet, Nubi Creole Arabic is a Creole with that typical profile that we've seen. Mauritian Creole French. French, okay, French is semi-analytic, but Bantu sure isn't, nor is Tamil, nor is Malagasy, nor is Wolof. Mandinka, we could argue, but there is no way that we could look at those languages and think that Mauritian Creole French, a highly analytic language, is somehow a predictable result within this uniformitarian schema. So, for example, I've often been asked as a Creolist, somebody intelligently asks, well, what would happen if in a Creole genesis situation both of the languages were heavily inflected? And many people want to know, would the Creole be heavily inflected? Has that been tested? And they often ask because the uniformitarians have a way of making it seem like all Creoles happen to have been based on rather analytic English and French, and then non-inflected languages in Africa such as Bay or Yoruba or Akan. But that's not true. Creoles have been based on a very wide variety of languages, and the test has long been done. So, Michel de Graff asks in passing in one of his, his opuses, what should be asked is whether a hypothetical Creole derived from contact among, say, Caucasian languages of the Tzez type would end up looking like Saramakan. Okay, but that idea has long been explored and I just showed you the result. Here, for the record, are just some relevant references making the point that Creoles lack as much as they retain from their source languages to an extent that renders them distinct results of language contact. Pay particular attention to Peter Bakker's work, which I have here as well as, of course, work of my own. So, any work you read from the uniformitarian perspective that doesn't acknowledge the Palancaro challenge has not given you the data you need to decide whether Creoles are a kind of language. Now, certainly, sometimes people who air a uniformitarian paper or book, they don't happen to be specialists in Creole studies, just like I'm not a specialist in things outside of language change and Creole studies. And so, it ends up looking like uniformitarianism is a settled business in a way that it isn't. That is true of this piece that has appeared in Nature 
recently by Damian Blasi and Susanna Michaelis and Martin Haspelmath saying that Creole exceptionalism has been disproved because you can see that Creole languages retain features from their source languages and don't get them from somewhere else. That's what this title about grammars or robustly transmitted means. But very simply, does this piece, which has gotten so much attention, including in language log, prove that Creoles are not a kind of language? It proves that Creoles are language mixtures beautifully, although I'm not sure anybody has denied that for a very long time. Since Derek Bickerton, he wouldn't like this paper, but he stands alone at this point if he still believes that Creoles are not replete with substrate influence. But no one denies the mixture. So the question is, how robust is this transmission in Creole languages? How about a schema? Here's a big red square, here's a big blue square, and in between is a lavender square. Now, the lavender square is lavender because red and blue combined and they created that color. Okay, but there's something else that created this square in between. It's not just a combination of the two, it looks like it's, it's smaller. And so, you look at this and you think to yourself, what's being proven here? Now, now imagine somebody saying, well, it's ridiculous that the purple square is smaller. It can't be smaller than the red or the blue squares. That's just an illusion. Because purple is one part red and one part blue. What do you mean it's smaller? You're just not looking at it properly. You're, you're discriminating against it. Only if that makes sense can you say that the Nature article proves that Creoles don't come from some kind of break in transmission. Now, one doesn't wish to caricature, and you may reasonably suspect me of doing it right now. Of course, you might be wondering, do they really think there's no evidence of Creoles coming from pigeons? Because, of course, some evidence of that kind is incontrovertible. Everybody knows that Tok Pisin started as a pigeon, that there was a pigeon at the root of Hawaiian Creole English. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah, including the uniformitarians. But they want us to believe something that really is peculiar. So here's Tok Pisin, here's Sranam. This is how you say, I was going in both languages. Now in both cases, you have the overgeneralization of the oblique form such that it's just me across the board instead of there being I and me. You have the past and the progressive indicated with these separate morphemes. You have this extreme analyticity. The languages seem to be akin. It's why they're discussed in the same books and at the same conferences. But the uniformitarians want us to think that Tok Pisin came from a pigeon, because you can't deny that, but that something like Sranang or Haitian or Cape Vergian came from just languages mixing together. It was all different. Now, what's the explanation? Well, Mufwene says, different evolutionary trajectories can nonetheless produce similar structural outcomes. Okay, that sounds kind of Darwinian. It's, it's, you know, it's a neat idea, but we need more. Elsewhere, he has said, structural similarities between expanded pigeons and creoles reflect the fact that they were developed largely by linguistic adults interacting regularly among themselves using materials from typologically related European and or substrate languages to meet diverse and complex communicative needs. But what really does this mean? But doesn't this say that Tokpisan and Sranan developed in the same way, or diverse and complex communicative needs. Isn't that a little mystically put? And how were these diverse and complex communicative needs different in Suriname versus Oceania? And no, Mufwene has never addressed these sorts of questions. He has not engaged on these sorts of things. He just proclaims them. So really, if the result was the same, why should we suppose that the genesis process was different? I mean, if you're going to make that claim, then you'd better bring your A-game, because it really does go against Occam's razor 
to suppose such a thing. Now, is it because there's no documentation of pigeons spoken on plantations? That's a big Mufwene point. But I'm sorry, that's not a smackdown point at all. Quite simply, on early plantations, almost nobody visited and barely anybody ever wrote anything down except when somebody dropped dead, which was often, and somebody would put a cross on a piece of paper. There was no linguistic documentation of anything. So, some of us deduce that plantation creoles were born of the same process as Tokpisan because they differ from their source languages in the exact same way and were born amidst precisely similar socio-historical conditions. In other words, because science. So, let me tell you something untrue. Creoles are simply languages developed by subordinate people amidst European colonialism from about 1490 to 1900. I just told you an untruth. I'm going to tell you another one. Listen to me lie. There is no structural litmus test that shows that a language is a Creole. It sounds so sensible, you'll read it in a lot of places. It's not true. In later lessons, we will address all the things that you've heard or read that supposedly prove that Creoles aren't linguistically interesting, and that 50 years of Creole studies has been a tacitly racist, yes, I went there and I'm going to do it again, mistake. Such as, little preview here, does Chomsky and minimalist theory reveal that Creoles are just mixtures like all other languages? I'm afraid not. Such as, no features have been discovered that occur only in Creoles, but no one has ever said there were any. Anything you read claiming that is like saying that somebody has denied gravity by saying that they don't see anything floating sideways. No one would or has said anything of the sort. Now, I have indeed said that there are three things that a language can lack together that reveal that a language was born from a break in transmission. But, next thing that we're going to address in one of these lessons is, has anyone revealed a language with no such history that has those three features together? I'm afraid not despite what you may have heard. I will explain, and I'm going to explain it hard. So, format. Every two weeks, for seven segments, maybe eight, I am going to address a canard that the uniformitarians have broadcast about Creole exceptionalism. A week later, I'll address questions and comments that the post elicits, and then a week after that, I will proceed to addressing another canard. Now, if their past response to Creole exceptionalist work is any guide, the uniformitarians will continue to speak and write as if the points I'm making in this series had never been raised except in parenthetical asides. However, if by chance the uniformitarians actually respond to these points for once after 20 years, I'm going to do another series in response, and it's going to be higher tech than this one, and I'm going to broadcast it more widely, and that cycle will continue indefinitely. The misrepresentation of Creole exceptionalism to the linguistics community stops now. Wrapping up for today. Creole studies has not been a 50-year mistake. The idea that Creoles are just language mixtures is a radical proposition which, in the end, fails. Please send questions if you have them, and do stay tuned for more lessons. I'm going for something whole here. It's on. Let's go.